Well, for more, we're joined from Washington by Harry Kazianis, president of the Rogue Steg Proj Project and senior editor of uh, 1945.com. Thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. And also in our company, from our international affairs desk, Garmin Georgian. Armin, let's begin with uh, images we had from earlier. The Japanese prime minister, Kishido Fumio, uh, in the company of the commander of the uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific uh, uh, Command. Uh, these uh, images uh, sent through earlier, as were those, the, that footage you saw uh, from the, uh, uh, of those joint military exercises. What are some of the other reactions we're seeing? Well, since you mentioned Japan, uh, Francois, so uh, various defense and military analysts uh, being quoted in Japanese media, they're saying that uh, these missile uh, uh, alerts will uh, help uh, Japanese politicians to uh, argue for an even bigger increase in the defense budget and a more proactive uh, defense policy, uh, obviously uh, with the ante anticipated few, uh, new, uh, North Korean test that we heard about in Solange Mougin's uh, report there. Uh, apart from that, obviously strong words from uh, South Korea uh, officials there saying that North Korea will have to pay a price for this launch. And um, quite a lot of uh, f telephone diplomacy, it seems, uh, from the United States as well, the Secretary of State speaking to his counterparts both in uh, South Korea and Japan and uh, setting out uh, what uh, the State Department calls an ironclad commitment to uh, both of those countries. Yeah, so <clears throat> Harry Kazianis, the, the question everybody's asking uh, uh, when they did learn the news here in Europe when they woke up was why now? Simple, the war in Ukraine. Uh, Kim Jong-un has, has pretty much figured out very quickly that he is able to essentially test almost any type of nuclear weapon missile that he wants, and there'll be very little that the United States can do about it. I mean, let's face it, there's no way that Joe Biden is going to be able to call Vladimir Putin or Xi Jinping and ask for their help on North Korea. In fact, the, the thing that makes this even worse is that the Chinese, because of their large border with North Korea, essentially control the sanctions regime. I think it's very clear that these days the Chinese probably aren't doing much to help that sanctioned regime. So the North Koreans understand with Joe Biden basically unable to do much when it comes to their missile tests and probable nuclear tests in the next couple of weeks. The North Koreans have the ability to test these weapons in a maybe a once in a, a generation opportunity to do that. So stay tuned. There's going to be a lot more missile tests in the, the days and weeks to come. It's interesting what you're saying, because in the past, generally, uh, the speculation has always been when there's a big missile test that uh, there's some reason of domestic politics, uh, Kim trying to shore up his stature at home. Uh, or simply that Pyongyang is vying for the world's attention. You're saying it's completely different this time. Well, all those things are always true. I mean, let, let's face it, North Korea loves the attention. They, Kim Jong-un wants to show he's a strong man, even though his country's basically starving in a giant prison camp of 25 million people. But the North Koreans know that when the war in Ukraine is over, there will be a lot more attention back on them. And potentially, you know, Russia might be a little more amenable to trying to help on North Korea, you know, trying to get back in the, in the global good graces of, of pretty much every country. China, to some extent as well. But I think Kim Jong-un understands this is the time where he is able to do a lot more testing and pay almost no price for it. And I do think that means a nuclear test is coming, specifically a tactical nuclear weapon, which the North Koreans have been talking about for some years now. A tactical nuclear weapon. Explain. So, in other words, what was called a battlefield nuclear weapon, something small, maybe even smaller than the bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima or Nagasaki, something that could maybe take out a, a whole division, maybe take out a port. The North Koreans are trying to field weapons that they feel would help them win a nuclear war, which sounds very terrifying. But they're essentially afraid that if the United States was to mass a lot of forces in the Korean Peninsula and invade, they want battlefield nuclear weapons that could destroy ports, bridges, uh, maybe not knock out a whole city or elicit such a big U.S. response, but something they feel is usable. That's what makes it very terrifying. We're getting a common theme here, Armin George, and uh, when you hear Harry talking about tactical nuclear weapons, because I grew up with the Cold War. Uh, we were told nuclear weapon is a nuclear weapon and it's mutually assured destruction. These days, it seems as though there's different levels of nuclear weapons. Well, obviously, that whole... Um 
world, you know, order, the security, the rules-based order, as, as the West sees it, has been coming apart in the last few years. And it actually, there was a, something which didn't get much attention because the world was in the grips of COVID. But in 2020, Russia uh, changed its nuclear doctrine uh, and it uh, basically uh, incorporated a possible nuclear response to stop uh, an attack on Russian territory with conventional weapons. So that greatly raised the stakes. Uh, and obviously, this is why a lot of people have been worried about uh, the these um, recognition, the you know, Russian recognitions of the, uh, the quote, referendum results, because then, you know, if, uh, as it were, Russian territory is attacked, could there be a nuclear response? But uh, it's not just Russia, you know, China, of course, is becoming a lot more assertive as well in uh, the case of Taiwan and the South China Sea. And all of this had le has led to some soul searching among countries that have up until now subscribed to this idea of the non-proliferation treaty. In other words, they can rely on bigger powers like the US to provide a nuclear umbrella, but that seems to be changing. So, for example, this survey that came out in South Korea a few months ago where 71% of respondents said that South Korea should become a nuclear armed state. That gives you a pretty good idea of how this whole world order um, is changing. And, of course, countries will look at what's happening in Ukraine and say, well, can we really uh, uh, you know, rely on the non-proliferation treaty principle or do we sort of go our own way develop our own weapons because you know it's a kind of it's a jungle out there now uh harry kazianis uh during the cold war uh there was this idea that uh we knew how to speak the language of deterrence was that the case when it came to north korea well, I think the language we speak to North Korea is very maximalist language. I mean, there's been a universal bipartisan sort of process here in Washington. You know, one thing that, that Republicans and Democrats agree on is North Korea and that the North Koreans need to somehow give up all of their nuclear weapons, need to completely disarm. And I think watching this for over a decade now, I, I can convincingly tell you the North Koreans are never going to give up their nuclear weapons. I mean, the North Koreans are students of history and they understand that the United States is very good at taking apart regimes that it does not like, that does, they do not have weapons of mass destruction. So there's no amount of money, no amount of convincing, no amount of diplomacy that will ever convince the North Koreans to give up these weapons. So you talked about deterrence. We need to start talking about North Korea in terms of deterrence, explaining to them that, that if they ever use these weapons, that they would be an, an equal and maybe even bigger proportionate response. And I think we're eventually going to have to start to talk to the North Koreans about arms control, what we did with the Soviet Union back in the 1970s and 1980s to lower tensions. Of course, that comes with political risks here in Washington. Whoever says that, immediately they'll be accused of appeasement and, you know, talking to a dictator. I mean, all those things, you know, there, there is some truth in those things. But I think we need to understand that we do not have any sort of incentive structure to have North Korea give up these weapons. So now we need to start talking about how to mitigate that threat. It's, it's very politically challenging, but it's something at some point someone here in Washington is going to have to do. And when was the turning point? Was it as Armin described it back in 2020 when uh, a, a lot of those uh, nuclear treaties lapsed? Or was it last Friday when we heard those nuclear-sized th threats from the Kremlin again? Well, I think when it comes to, to North Korea, I actually go back to 2017 when they started testing intercontinental range ballistic missiles. I mean, here's a country that has a, an economy that's only worth something like $15 billion. And because they've essentially starved their own people, they were able to steal, lie, and cheat their way and, and build these nuclear weapons and now have the ability to threaten Washington, D.C., to threaten New York, and eventually someday even possibly threaten Paris. I mean, that's that's how far the weapons ranges can go. I mean, this technology is you know, 1960s, 1950s, in some respects, technology. So it's not shocking the North Koreans have this. But I think we're, we're coming to a point where people are going to start to realize, yes, North Korea is a nuclear weapon state. They are dangerous. And now we've got to work to mitigate and lessen that threat. We're not going to be able to make it go away. One final question for you, Harry Kazianis. Uh, we have, uh, for the first time in several years, a uh, U.S. Uh, aircraft carrier in South Korea. What, what are your thoughts on the timing of that? 
Well, I, I think that's probably another reason that reinforced the idea for the North Koreans to do these tests. The North Koreans are petrified of anything that is involved, aircraft carriers or B-2 bombers or B-1 bombers, anything that they feel that they do not have a way to really negate those advantages of those weapons makes the North Koreans freak out. And traditionally, that is a lot of the times when they do those missile tests or nuclear tests. And it's something the Trump administration held off for a long time. But we have a conservative government in Seoul. We have a Biden administration that's trying to flex its muscles on the Korean Peninsula. And it, it creates a powder keg, to be honest with you. Harry Kazianis, uh, uh, president of the Rogue States Project. Thank you so much for speaking with us from Washington. Thanks as well uh, to Armin George and monitoring us. Thank you.